Okay. Welcome, YouTubers. We are now live streaming at my studio practice. So today we're going to look at um, feather shapes. Let's go across to the demo class. Here we go. We are going to be looking at feather shapes. Now this is the episode that I didn't upload. Um, I just felt like painting and I was interested in painting the underside of the feathers here in the not the correct way but in a way that shows you know, a greater level of observation. Now for me when I look at hummingbirds and I've been lucky to see them in Costa Rica and Mexico the top side of the wing which is this right wing in the image here is opaque you can't see through it and um, I haven't seen through it but the underside backlit against the light is translucent it lets the light through it's not transparent it doesn't let the light and the image through it lets the light through so it's translucent and so uh, when it does that the overlap of the feathers creates a pattern which is something that I want to include in my art and in this example although I've gotten closer um, it's not anywhere near uh, as successful as I would want it to be and so I wanted to demonstrate using uh, pieces of paper let's say this is a flying feather here a primary feather you can see that this one represents let's say the leading feather the, the foremost feather and its companion beside it and that's okay from the top it looks like there's feathers overlapping but I want to try this as an experiment if I bring a lamp hopefully one of my lamps will help with this this will be successful if I do this you can see that where the overlap is there is a slight shadow can you see that there's a little overlap and it forms a kind of tracery pattern to see so as I move the papers you can see that there is an overlap which creates a darkened center between the two feathers and that's a pattern that's repeated throughout the wing so it's a detail that I admire when I look at photographs of uh, hummingbirds and it's something that I wanted to include. So if I was including it, it would mean that there would be a darkened strip between where this feather overlaps, disappears and appears here on this side and this feather overlaps, comes through and appears on this side here. So let me demonstrate with a drawing. The hummingbird feathers are the product of design. Let's take this as the first feather. This is the leading feather. There we go. And let's have an overlapping secondary feather here. This neighboring feather would come up over here and overlap. And just as we saw in the demonstration with the light, there is this is a single layer, one layer, one layer of feather. But here there's an overlap where the light is trying to pass through two layers of feather. And so there is a 
shaded overlap area and intersection between the feathers, which is slightly darker. There's two layers of feathers there. Okay, and that would be similarly the case with this feather here. And of course the next feather, whoop, the next feather beside, there would be the corresponding overlap there. Okay. Which means if we look at the third feather in the sequence, okay, between it and the previous feather, we can see a very interesting pattern emerge. It's this pointed tip and then a kind of curved or concave tracery on the inside. which is only made visible by this section here. The overlap, which I'm now darkening, so you can see it a whole lot better. So if we look at this dark shape here, it resembles this. It comes up and widens. It comes up and widens and then forms the tip. So. If we had a name for this, it would be easier to describe it. And if I call that, let's say for instance, I called it the spear, because it does have the appearance of a spear coming to a point, a very long handle there, coming to a tip at the end. That spear is the light area bounded by two uh, overlapping areas. They're almost like lenses, really. Have the appearance of a lens. Okay, so that is the shape. Now, there is a problem. That complicates it because if we take the first feather, the first flight feather, and the second flight feather, I made them fairly generous. The detail is also complicated by the fact that each feather, if we study them in detail, has a quill which is offset past the center. So let's darken this area here. We'll darken the quill. And on this one here, we'll darken the quill abnormally so, so that you can see it a lot better. Okay. And so when we have an area of overlap, which was seen before, which I'm calling, for want of a better description, a lens, like in a lens shape, like so. It also has a darkened ridge running through it, which is due to the fact of the presence of the quill. There is another factor that complicates this, is that the membrane is webbed. So the feather is actually made up of little barbs, which travel in this direction, travels in a kind of tick direction. So if this is a quill, each is a sort of tick, 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 like a tick, that way. So that the barbs point upwards towards the point, like so. They always point in this manner. Like if you're drawing a very simplified arrow, a very simplified arrow, the barbs on the feather travel in this direction. Now because these are flying feathers, they need a kind of rigidity against them. 
that makes them strong and so they've got a fairly thick quill in rate in relation to the lightness and strength of the feather and so with all these ideas put together it's it's quite a complex it's it's quite a complex kind of problem to solve i think it would be more successful I mean, i've tried to attempt it here but i've i've not been successful there would be a darkened overlap area but what i have tried to do is show the barbing on the feather in the correct direction using the scraffito technique using an a sharp object to scratch through the wet paint and create a kind of texture but i know that uh, the overlap kind of lens area as i call it the kind of lens area where there's um, two layers of feathers is not pronounced enough it's not painted accurately enough at all and so um, for me to resolve this problem I feel I would um, need to paint bigger much bigger to get that level of detail in however at this was this about I don't know 15 by 12 maybe something like that it's big enough to be able to do it um, but i wonder about my ability to do so okay so i've made an attempt at a distance it does look like a hummingbird that is flying um it's reasonably plausible the underside is lighter the top side is slightly darker it's as it should be but i just feel that i could do probably a better attempt with later attempts so that's the feather theory that's the feather design and now the rest of it is um basically tweaking away just tweaking away at the painting areas that are of interest to me so one area of interest is the head of the guitar it remains unresolved this area here so if we we're talking about guitar construction or luthery we'd be talking about the headstock of the guitar here this part so it's not um, it's not resolved at all so I'm going to take a number of earth colors I'm going to take some of my raw amber that I showed you some yellow ochre here and some warmer uh, burnt umber which is this one here and a small amount of linseed oil because that was lovely to work with It's a lot more yellow and clearer than the stand oil. It is much more honeyed in colour. And I now know that I only need the tiniest amount mixed with a lot of water to maintain the fat over lean uh, principle that we've been trying to follow. So a lot of water in here to get through the kind of milkiness. And let's see, my coolest color, I suppose, is the
raw amber. So just mixing the consistency in with a combination of water and linseed oil. Let's see how it transferred to the surface. Okay, kind of inky. Personally, I like the inky. And that has the effect of creating a base. So of the three colours, it's my darkest value. Having laid it on, it is inky. Um, I'm resolving to work with a slightly thicker paint, but with more medium in it. So I should really invest in bristle brushes, but I do like my sable. My background is uh, largely, my experience um, is painting birds in watercolour. And so I still retain that sort of desire to do that. Okay, so there's the headstock mapped out. That's the area that we're interested in. To about there, where you can see the line I've drawn in. The pegs would be facing away from us, but to make them uh, become the uh, source of the stems, what I'm trying to do is instead of looking at them sort of face on like that, I'm trying to reverse them to open them up and that way these um, you know uh, stems and sepals can be included so it's a deliberate device to help make um, um, you know to make that possible. I'm trying to remember a phrase from Walt Disney. I think it was the logical improbable. The phrase will come back to me. So for the meantime, that's what I'm trying to do here, is to show a headstock that allows the stems and sepals of these plants to exist. Now this is the area where transition between the headstock and the flowering form should exist somewhere there, should be a transition. And ideally, that would have been great to work in wet and wet. But unfortunately, I have to stop when I'm tired, as most people do, but I get tired very, very quickly. So what I'm doing now is I'm moving into the burnt umber, which is a warmer colour, and I don't think there's going to be any visible difference there. I don't think there's any difference that can be seen on screen. So there's very little separation from that. And that's disappointing from my point of view. So having said that, the next uh, colour is my lightest value, 
which is now not pure um, yellow ochre, but yellow ochre that has been mixed with some of the burnt umber and the residual um, raw umber, which was the first level that was laid down. What I'm trying to do is create the illusion of the kind of wood veneer, which is placed on the face of the headstock of the guitar. And many of these woods are very, very beautiful indeed. But creates a bit of a conflict for me because I love my guitars, but I also love my rainforest. And there we go. There's some texture in there. And so there is a conflict for me because uh, one of my loves, the, the classical guitar, is responsible for diminution of the rainforest. So it has a direct impact. So I have made this mix a little bit more oily, you know, a little bit more fat by adding oil in the form of linseed oil into the paint mix. And also I've tried to keep the, the paint above the kind of um, inky mix that I normally do. So there's a transition going out the way, which is as you can see, becoming more like the, the color of the palette below it. So I feel that there needs to be a little bit more transition here. The transition needs to start earlier with more yellow ochre and also pulling both of the umbers up into the, the greenery. Okay, so there is a bit of a transition there. And there is a suggestion that the wood is more striped and striated, like the Indian rosewood or the Brazilian rosewood eh, or the Zirikote or Zebrano woods or coco bolo woods that they use as veneers for the the front of the guitar. So if I was working much bigger than this on a much larger scale, I would be able to put that patterning in, I think, in increasing detail. But for a, a relatively small painting like this, um, that's okay. Next, since I've got the umbers out, I think I will go back, go back into my um, linseed oil. and stay with the burnt umber, the warmer of the umbers. The raw umbers uh, is a bit, a little bit on the cooler side. And so, lots of oil. And just a gentle build up here for the shadow area. Now remember that umber actually means shadow. So what I'm trying to do is create a shadow side. Even although, uh, as I explained earlier in other um, live streams, that in this painting here, 
one of the features of it is that there is no direct light source. Everything is equally lighted in you know, all directions. But sometimes that rule is broken. Right, for instance, here. So we've got a dark side here, which means that if the light source was coming from this direction, the inside of the padlock on this side would be slightly darker. So the only reason I'm doing this is to make the more uh, make this form more readable to the viewer. Okay, now. I only put a small amount of paint on it, so now using largely a dry brush, I should be able to incorporate some of that colour into the gold, the gold effect that I'm trying to create. I am worried about giving a kind of dirty look to the paint. That's not my intention at all. But I do want to have a dark side which is in shade and a light side which is facing towards an imagined light source. But again, allow me to reiterate that in this painting, because there is ubiquitous light, the light is from all directions equally lit up. Uh, the presence of highlights like this side here, or the highlight on the eye, or this little droplet here with the living tadpole or whatever inside the teardrop exists. Um, those are exceptions to the rule. So I'm breaking my own ubiquitous light rule. So but I suppose that's one of the one of the joys of painting from your imagination is that you know the laws of physics <laughs> don't have to apply to the things that you create. There's an area that I haven't addressed yet, um, which is the flower forms. The flower forms over this side, which have had no treatment whatsoever. They've not even had um, anything else other than staining. So these areas here, these flower forms, what I'm going to do is draw in their shape using umber. To remind myself of their form and to help me imagine where overlap areas are, like this one here. So I don't know enough about flowers at all and so I went online and I found a group on Facebook which specializes in uh, specializes in painting um, flowers, so I can get inspiration and also something. You know, uh, botanical as illustrators are particularly um, keen on observing their forms and being true to the science. So. Oop. That's far too liquidy. Okay, this shape here, this form here, is a kind of overlapping form. Here. So we have an overlap area. And some ribbing to show the texture of the flower or the kind of crenellations that some of these flowers have. So I'm optimistic that by looking at 
the botanical illustration group, I can learn more about the plants that hummingbirds feed off and I can get inspiration from the forms and also see what other art, other artists are creating. Also, I'm beginning to become interested in uh, the idea of digital art so that if I ever want to change my mind about a specific item or detail, it would be easier to change it. So what I'm doing here is I've made up a sort of pink. Well, it is pink. Using my cadmium, uh, my cadmium red light and some titanium white. And I don't know how the colouring of this um, detail should go at all. I'm not sure. So let's warm up a little. There. And so it might be an idea just to block in the area so that once I see it I get a chance to ruminate on how successful it is and yeah, maybe it does go to a creamy tip like that same with the next one All I know is that there needs to be a, some sort of separation between this kind of bromeliad form and this flower form um, behind it. So the paint is rather oily. I know it's oil paint but it does have a kind of oily syrupy feel under the hairs of the brush. So what I'm doing right now is I'm doing a kind of shading kind of stroke in the hope that some of the umber will create um, ombre or transition between the brown and the pink. And now I'm going to go in with a very vibrant red. Oh yeah, it's too strong. So I'm going to have to pull that out somewhat. And I'm going to have to thin that out. So I've wiped off the brush off screen. I've wiped off the brush and if I pick up material here I can deposit it here and that helps me to reduce that impact somewhat. So yes, using a kind of shading technique with the brush. Although I do like the clash of the red against this green. It's a very sap looking green. It's a very fresh 
Okay, spring green. Let's try some pink. Okay, it's not pink enough. So what I need to do is uh, introduce a, a much, much lighter pink than the one I'm currently enjoying. Okay, let's try this. Okay. So at least that creates a separation between this flower and the bromeliad, which originates from the side of the fingerboard. So that at least uh, works. But now what I need to do is a similar kind of shading. So a kind of fussy, a fussy kind of, you know, back and forward in this area here. Introducing the red into the pink. In a graded manner. So again, a kind of shading motion. Dabbing first of all to get the colour on, but then a shading motion to get the pink. And what I feel now is that the contrast between this flower and that flower needs to be accentuated. So I feel as if I need a stronger stronger red but tempered somewhat with the smallest addition of blue so some of my cerulean blue mix for this area here has been used to kind of knock it back a little bit just take the edge off it ever so slightly okay so clearly these are red pink flowers now that end in a kind of lighter tip. Again, back into the lighter of the pinks. So this, whoop, rotate the brush inside the mix to get a fine point. So just turn it like this, a kind of turning motion. And almost up to the end. Leaving a little bit of separation between the overlapping flower forms and hopefully picking up a little bit of the umber there to kind of just nudge it back, take the edge off, soften it a little before we go back in with my um, cadmium red light. Which was my vermilion substitute. Okay. Kind of lost the edge there, that needs to be redrawn. So a little bit of water to help it flow like ink. Back in. Yep, flowing a little bit better there with the addition of a small amount of water. Okay, there we go. Okay, and now these tips need to be addressed with a lot more white. I'm just painting and my painting decisions are being influenced just by the paints that I happen to have in my box. So, sadly I did not invest in zinc white which is zinc is more often your uh, mixing white. Titanium white is very, very strong. It's very powerful. And so 
needs to be used with judicious care. I'm noticing because the water that I've used is becoming a little bit dirty, that's helping temper, uh, helping to temper the color mixes that I'm making. So they're not as strong as they could be. And sometimes people do that with watercolor and actually deliberately let their, let's check that, oh, that's very strong. Let's that back a little. Um, they allow their water to deliberately get dirty. In the prospect of helping their colors to harmonize a little. Oh wow, that water has really brought out the lightness of the titanium. Okay, there may be some lifting out needed. So once again, I'd like to reiterate that I'm just exploring. I'm learning as I go. I'm hopefully presenting a model of what it is like for an artist to think through the problems that they face and not know all the answers. Just find out as they go and learn. So I don't profess to know all the answers. I just hope to uh, document document uh, the process that I go through to arrive at my creativity. Now, this is important to me because almost two years ago, I was assaulted at work and the individual lacked capacity so they didn't know what they were doing but they damaged my right hand, my dominant hand and so this has been a bit of a journey for me to get back to the ability to paint and do fine motor control. So that's one element. The other element is that I know that I'm beginning to show signs of an illness that my daughter has, a condition that my daughter has. Um, and so I'm beginning to see signs about myself where with early, uh, it's called essential tremor and after exertion, small amounts of exertion can create um, a handshake, which is a shakiness in the hand, which is difficult to control. And so it's important for me to document that at this stage in my life, I was able to do this. So, and actually I enjoy doing this, so long may it continue. Okay, some of that whiteness right on the tip and then blended in, that's far too white there, so I'll wipe off on my space and hopefully make a gentler transition. But certainly that side of the painting does need a lift. It lacks a kind of boldness and separation that perhaps doing something like this will do. It may work. But what I'll do is what I always do is that after this kind of session, and even if I wasn't live streaming at all, I would have a painting session like this. So this is just my studio practice. And 
go away and think about how it's worked and if it's successful or not <laughs> and whether I need to just oh that color is completely wrong or you know say oh that that did actually work that was actually a good move so let's try this lighter pink in here okay it's all right now this light pink against a lighter version of the blue i think would really sing out i think those would be a nice uh, juxtaposition but this is okay there needs to be bells so I've got some very very light pink I've got some yellow ochre we should be able to make an orange okay we have it so this should be able to form the center of the daffodils I was just looking very, very closely recently at the paintings of Henri Rousseau and it becomes apparent by looking at his work that he worked in a fairly similar style, painting layer upon layer. And you can see this in his paintings because you know some of the under layers actually show through. Uh, in a kind of similar manner so making a kind of trumpet here first of all suggesting the form let's rotate it this way see how we get on and then maybe deepening the form so we've suggested it Whoops. rotate the brush get rid of that ochre okay so the form exists now oh yeah that's much better Now, this is one of those rare occasions that during the course of this painting that I've worked uh, wet and wet, which allows us to make those transitions. That red is abnormally red. That's far too much. <laughs> and yet, it just feels like so much fun. If I do this. Okay, this may have to be my darkest value. So, I've created a kind of mid value. I'm going in with a darker value. And then guess what? I'm gonna to have to go in with my lightest value, a much lighter value than this. So a lot more yellow ochre. I think. A lot more yellow ochre, a lot more white to dull it down. Give it a kind of chalkiness, oh, but I still need a bit of red. Right. Okay, let's see how we go. Okay, you can draw the details in, let them merge. 
give the suggestion of form. That we kind of um, ribbing, which is on the trumpets. And just play around with the colours. But I'm aware that the more spent time I spend actually moving the colour around, the more it blends. So if I want a purer set of colours. What I should do is lay them down and not interfere with them. But working entirely wet and wet is a la prima, and that's not something that I'm demonstrating at the moment. I'm trying to learn how to cope with um, short amounts of energy and short amounts of um, attention span. But that's okay. So now that that red is there, this yellow seems very glaring. This is a very glaring uh, yellow. I can nudge that back down. There's my yellow ochre. So let's see how a pale pink. Not too too much. So with a stronger dilution, it may become more translucent. So yes, I do want the flavour of yellow there, but I don't want it quite so strongly and actually there seems to be a desire to go more pink and by lightening up this area here it creates a stronger contrast between it and the um, paint palette behind it. Okay, we need something to dull that down. So, reaching for the olive part of my green. Let's see, can we get some ribbing in there? Okay, yeah, we can. And that ribbon is helping take some of the intensity away. And is luckily presenting a little bit of violet. A slight purple bias. which is the complement to yellow. It's okay. Let's get some some uh, stamens in. So we need some stamens. And connect them. Again, maybe celebrate the olive 
a little bit more. Bring in some red, nudge it towards brown. Right. With the help of some umber, um, do we have potential line work? Yes, we do. Okay, so here we have the stamens connecting to the anthers. Just some tiny little details, and because they're backlit, let's get some of that pink in. So pink will now be the light value that helps show this up. There we go. Okay. Some tiny little statements. There we go. Very light on top of the dark. Double drawn and that is enough. It's enough. So what have we done? Well, we created a uh, headstock for the guitar, which slowly transitions into the flower. We nudge back the yellow in these flower forms and introduce a central um, flower form. A bit like the daffodils here, they have the kind of orange center inside the yellow. But the yellow has been nudged back a little bit. It's been dampened down with its complementary kind of very soft purple violet. These red flowers have been introduced in such a way as still have a separation between them and the bromeliad um, shapes which are working their way down the soundboard. And there's some ombre there or some you know, gent gentle transitioning. And I tried to use some umber there to kind of edge the gold there because it was too glaring. Uh, but I'm not sure how successful that is. So that may be revisited somewhat. And um, that is it for today. Thank you so much for joining me on this uh, particular journey. And thank you so much for and spending your time with me. I hope whoever watches this is inspired in their creativity and uh, explores the therapeutic value of art and creativity in their own life. Thank you for watching. Bye bye now.